Ryan Stanton here with ASEP Frontline, joined today by Dr. Jessica Whittle, and we're going to talk about sepsis, one of our favorite topics that we deal with. Um, we've had a couple of interviews on this in the past on the front line, and um, of course, it's always a moving target, and as soon as we start to get the version we hate, they, we find another way to make it worse, that we uh, like it even less, uh, including that potential threat of the one-hour bundle. But, you know, some of the things we want to talk about, some of those characteristics of the uh, of, of sepsis management in the emergency department and a talk here at Tennessee ASEP um, here in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Um, you talk about the sepsis guidelines, friend or foe, and, you know, clearly there are some aspects of the sepsis evaluation workup and management that are important with the evidence, but there's also things that many of us in emergency medicine feel like probably cross the line and potentially do harm. So let's dive into that. So give us kind of a teaser in terms of sepsis management. Where are we now? Ryan, thank you for having me. I think sepsis is a a topic that's complicated for all of us because it's such a spectrum disease. Uh, I think the thing that's most challenging for all of us is probably fluid administration. I think most people agree antibiotics are beneficial for everyone, but where we really struggle is knowing how much, uh, what kind, and when to give fluids. And so that's where I think we really struggle. That's the big challenge. The research shows that the earlier the recognition, the administration of appropriate antibiotics, the better our outcomes are going to be. Uh, Research showing that at least some fluids have better outcomes, probably because of the recognition, not necessarily because of the fluid itself. And, but with this case, you know, we, we have this thing sitting over our head, this 30 cc's per kilogram bolus of, of crystalloid, and you've got the patient in front of you who's got three or four plus pitting edema, who's already having a difficulty breathing, and I feel like the executioner coming in with all of these, all of these fluids, but the rules are saying if my patient has a low blood pressure or lactate greater than four, that that is the guideline. Right. So it's um, the history of this is really kind of interesting to read about. So the history of the fluid bolus comes from, it really started in the 1830s when the cholera epidemics happened in, in Europe. And somebody came along and figured out that if you injected a little bit of plain water into a kid with cholera, his pulse felt better. He still died in two hours, though. So uh, it didn't work for very long. And so then... Fast forward another 50 years, they figured out that as people were uh, hemorrhaging to death, if you resuscitated them with crystalloid fluids, you could save them. And so we began to understand concepts of shock. By the 1900s, uh, the turn of the century, we begin to understand shock as we think about it. And really, I think by the 1930s, the types of shock as we think about them now were beginning to be described wasn't until the 1970s and 1980s that we began to understand the concepts of distributive shock, hemorrhagic shock, and hypovolemic shock. And interestingly, those models are still what we're basing our concept of fluid replacement on. So the problem was in the late 80s, we developed a fluid challenge model of sepsis where we said, this must be a hypoperfusion problem because we said people with sepsis were hypotensive. They were not producing enough urine. And so what they they must need then is more fluid. And this seemed to play out in the animal models. The problem was, and and they had an elevated lactate. The problem was in the models of people, that didn't play out to be the same. And so as we've developed newer understanding, um, we're beginning to have to challenge some of that. That's, and I feel like when I see these protocols, these recommendations, these metrics come out, we're being you're trying to paint every painting with the same brush, when instead of, I mean, it's almost, you know, when we talked about the opioid standpoint, it's that, you know, finding that easy button that kind of got us into trouble. And it seems like here we have now trying to get this easy button of we just do this to everybody and so easy a caveman could do it kind of stuff. But it has the potential of significant harm. And, you know, I talked to, when we have brought up in the past the whole idea of this fluid bolus in certain populations, thing is, well, we can always intubate somebody and manage their airway. But we know that once they get into that condition, once we get them intubated, the likelihood of morbidity and mortality is going to go up, especially if we can avoid it to start with. And we know the things with oxygen. We give too much oxygen, it's bad. We give too much of almost anything in medicine, it's bad. But 
that doesn't seem that hasn't seemed to have been much of the conversation so far with the sepsis guidelines. So that's a really interesting point. So what happened was in the 70s and 80s when we thought, well, sepsis was a function of hypoperfusion and and a lack of oxygenation. The observation was people were hypotensive, they weren't making urine, and they had an elevated lactate. And again, this was based on animal models. We thought if we provided ex extra fluid, we would improve oxygen transport and people would get better. The problem then became we did all that, and at first it looked like that may improve outcomes, and we saw early goal-directed therapy, and there were improved outcomes. But then when we began to challenge each part of that bundle, what we found was that it was probably the recognition in early treatment and antibiotics that was making the difference. What's interesting is all these animal models on which this was based in the concept of lactate was somewhat flawed in the sense that all the animal models are based on hypodynamic shock. Mm -hmm. And in humans, sepsis is hyperdynamic. And so it really boils down to what we find so often is that humans are not mice. And so we can't directly apply the science. As we found that lactate is coming from other sources, as we found that we are a hyperdynamic model, and as we found that we need to treat fluids more like a drug, we are finding that probably some of our recommendations need to change. And I think you've hit on the most important point. We do need to give fluids. We do need to give antibiotics. We need to do things. We need to give oxygen when people are hypoxic. But then we have to stop. Mm -hmm. And we can't just continue to do this for 9 and 12 and 15 liters. We need to give it. We need to give it early. We need to resuscitate our patients. And then we need to stop. And unfortunately, we're not very good at that. Well, that puts us all and everybody listening, all the emergency physicians and staffs out there, puts in a difficult position because where we are is the metrics and the rules that we play by are different from the evidence and information that we work by. And so we almost have to go either against evidence-based medicine and just go and give that blindly 30 cc's per kilogram, or we have to kind of pull back and expect that email that's going to come here in a couple of days or a couple of weeks once it's been reviewed that says you fell out of the sepsis metric and that this is a fallout. And the potential then question is whether, you know, your job security and, and safety of that position. So, you know, that puts physicians at a difficult situation of which one do I do? Do I know what's right and what the evidence is saying? Or do I go with the simple rules so I don't so I don't have to worry about my job or, or, or the security in the department? Well, I think there's a, there are some glimpses of hope on the horizon. There's two things. One, recently uh, CMS has changed and updated to allow for the 30 cc's per kilo to be based on ideal body weight mm -hmm. rather than actual body weight. And here in Tennessee, that makes a tremendous difference. Kentucky as well. Uh, because uh, many of our patients, if we use ideal body weight, we have to resuscitate them with a swimming pool. So remember to use ideal body weight, and that helps quite a bit. The second thing is that there are current studies uh, underway. The largest one, I think, is at uh, Massachusetts General. That is a randomized controlled trial looking at a more conservative versus liberal fluid therapy, and we really look forward to their results. And I think those will be available in the next year. That should really definitively answer this question. Now, I'm, I'm a huge fan of the ideal body weight, just exactly what you've talked about. You get somebody who comes in who's 300 pounds, 300, 350, 400 pounds, and, and you're doing the overall body weight, you are talking about a ton of fluids, and that's going to be detrimental for most everybody. If you look at most people based on ideal body weight, the volumes are much lower, and it's really, especially our elderly patients, their volumes are going to be pretty small, usually in that realm of a liter and a half or so. Is there a restriction, a rule, if I order that, on how long I can stretch that? Because initially it's like it has to be a bolus all in at one time, and then they say, well, it can stretch out some. Is there a point where they say, at this point, it's not really considered this therapy if we stretch it out that far? Yeah, actually, it can go out over six hours. So it really gives it quite a bit of time, even though the recommendations are that they begin initiated mm -hmm. in the CMS requirements recommend that it be initiated in the first three hours if they're in septic shock. The, surviving, the latest surviving sepsis campaign recommends initiation in the first hour, but the guidelines only require that it occur in the first six hours, so it can be stretched out over quite a period of time. And for most patients, that will be safe, particularly when you're including ideal body weight. 
The other thing that we can do to maximize safety for our patients is to consider the type of fluids we're using. We know that one of the dangers for many of our patients is the acidosis that can occur for using really large volumes of normal saline. And so by switching to balanced electrolyte solutions such as lactated ringers, particularly if you're going more than two liters, that can really improve safety profiles as well. For myself, when I am resuscitating beyond two liters, I usually switch to lactated ringers or for patients with acute kidney injury or those who may have some compromised renal function at baseline, I tend to be more sensitive and will switch to lactated ringers at an earlier, or earlier stage. Well, there's huge conversation now about that transition overall in emergency medicine to LR. I mean, you know, at, at some sure. point, the surgeons were right. Um, they've been sticking Don't with tell it. Don't tell them. I know. They've been sticking with it for years. And, uh, and, you know, we've been, most of the house of medicine otherwise has been some version of the normal saline, half normal saline, all that other stuff. And it seems like there's been a huge push, a lot of data, uh, data conversations and things like that about transitioning over to lactated ringers. I've personally transitioned most of my fluids over to LR to the point that we've had to get a larger LR bin, which is typically a very small one in, in your utility area compared to the normal saline. What are your thoughts? And that is kind of off this, this topic a little bit, but that transition and looking at it, because a lot of phys- physicians are you know, kind of surprised when you, when, or even my nurses, they come in and ask, you know, why are we doing LR, you know, as opposed to that tradition, because that old saying of it's the way we've always done it kind of stuff in medicine. So the, I think the study that most of us are changing our practice to some degree based on is the uh, large study that came out of Vanderbilt in the last year or so. I think it's a valuable study, although I don't think it's completely conclusive. It was published in New England Journal of Medicine as it should have been, I think it's an important study, although it should be taken with a grain of salt. If one looks at the fragility index of that study, if a single patient had had a different outcome in that study, it would have not been statistically significant. And so that being said, it's a very important study because it represents a tremendous, simply based on the sheer number of patients we treat with tremendous volumes of fluid, even affecting one or two patients is really important when you're talking about killing their kidneys. And so I think it represents a tremendous body of information and and an important topic. So I'm not sure that I'm ready to throw out all of my normal saline, particularly for healthy patients and particularly at smaller volumes of fluid, but I do think it's really important in our more delicate patients and especially those where we're resuscitating with very large volumes. And in those patients, I think it's worth switching and it's definitely changed my practice. And it's definitely worth, if you haven't looked into that data, looked into that evidence, I strongly encourage you to get in there, get that, look at the numbers, where things are. There's a lot of things out there. A lot of podcasts have done it. A lot of sites have done it. And the, there's data out there uh, to, to at least consider. One of the other big concerns I have with this sepsis screen where in Kentucky, with 29% tobacco use, the highest in the country still, many chronic lung disease, asthma, allergies, COPD, emphysema, all that stuff. Everybody who walks in from the parking lot is meets sepsis criteria. And the way that our EMRs are designed now, you know, theoretically the screen is, do you have concern for infection? Yes or no. If it's no, you're done. If it's yes, you come back. But now more and more EMRs, if you have any of these things pop positive that are the rest of it, it comes back and asks that question again, and they're automatically supposed to say yes if there's an elevated white count or yes if the respiratory rate goes up. And so it automatically flags them. And so we have all of these people that are getting these sets of cultures who are eventually sent home, maybe into the hospital if there's something else going on, but most of them go home, and then we end up with a positive culture. And we're calling these patients back to come back in for evaluation, you know, I've instructed most of our folks when they call back, you know, to, to actually do an, to kind of see where they are with their condition before we start saying, you need to come back to the ER, you have, you have a bacteria in your bloodstream. Is there any approach thought on the increased cost, increased risk associated with these increased evaluations and getting back people into the ED, especially for false positive blood cultures? That is a great question, Ryan. I do not have a solution to this, but I think it is an area where we really need to explore this further. And as much as I am not a huge fan of sepsis 3 and think that it really lacks sensitivity that we, that we need in the emergency department, 
I do applaud them for their efforts at improved sensitivity, and I think it is the sorts of data and the sort of study that we need to continue because the what you're describing is really is really critical. It's estimated that a false positive blood culture uh, costs on average in the country about $3,400 when you factor in a, a night in the hospital, repeat cultures, and, and waiting for those to turn negative. For exactly the reasons you're describing, patients have to come back in, be reevaluated. It's really important. But independent of cost, one of the things I think we need to factor in is what happens when we give patients antibiotics inappropriately. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I hear people always describe is, well, give them a dose, it won't hurt. That couldn't be further from the truth. At least one study has shown that patients given antibiotics within the preceding 90 days have a, a higher rate of sepsis as well as heart disease and a variety of other factors. We, we now understand that you have an increased rate of not only C. diff, but probably a, a whole variety of endovascular endo endothelial cell derangement and probably some immune derangement for some period of time after even a single dose of antibiotics. So these are not benign things that we're administering to patients. And as our antibiotics become ever more powerful and broad spectrum, this is a bigger and bigger deal. And these are significant things that we're doing to our patients, not only from a cost standpoint, but from a health standpoint. And as we have more and more fragile people living in the world, we need to really consider this. The, back, the antimicrobial argument is one that, that, and it was actually going to be my next question anyway, it's, a, it's something that fires me up because we have this whole conversation. We're trying to change the whole paradigm of medicine, of getting rid of the, quote, just in case antibiotics, the antibiotics for bronchitis, the antibiotics for sinusitis, all that stuff that we know that is not indicated for dealing with multidrug resistant bacteria dealing with C. diff. I've had two family members within the last five years, including one that was five, four years old, who ended up with C. diff from antibiotics that were provided inappropriately. And I mean, to say, you know, there's no risk is, is and you said it, it complete, it's, couldn't be further from the truth. And not to mention when we have these types of sepsis syndromes, people meeting the criteria, especially if you can't identify the source, we're coming to we're bringing a nuke to a knife fight, and we're bringing these multiple antibiotics, big swinging antibiotics that have a lot of risk with them already, and we're giving them to the patients that already have the risk factors, already have something else, even if it's not related to a sepsis syndrome. And, and I think, you know, with, as with healthcare, we have this huge pendulum of, of the way we do things. We go all in and figure out that we went too far, and then we swing back and come back and eventually reach that middle. And I feel like right now, with sepsis, we're kind of in that gone, gone too far. I understand the issue, why it was done, but then, you know, even now, even trying to, the recommendations that ASEP has pushed back against about the one-hour bundle, as opposed to those three-hour bundles, has, is even pushing it even farther, and I think that research is going to have to come out eventually that says, what is our, what was our benefit from going into these types of protocols versus the cost from those protocols, and really where we need to be, and you know, I wonder at some point compared to what was standard care, how different it's going to be from where we were before. Well, I think there's some still some great targets out there. Uh, Procalcitonin is, is still, I think, quite promising. I think there's still some other biomarkers that we can include. I think there's still development of other options, things that can be added, to, for example, to ISTAT platforms, such as a Procalcitonin, that can change the surge plus possible infection concept uh, and make it more sensitive and refine our way of defining sepsis such that we can do what sepsis 3 was hoping to do in a meaningful way so that we do exactly what we're hoping to do, which is uh, not inappropriately prescribe antibiotics and still not miss these people and allow them to sit out in our waiting rooms dangerously. But you're right, that's, that's what we have to do. I think we forget, we're so quick to forget, sepsis is deadly. It has 10 times the, the death rate of a heart attack or a stroke, and yet these people, we don't mobilize all the resources that we do for, you know, these code stimmies or code strokes. We get everyone up in arms all the way, and yet we can't just go out, like you said, and give them antibiotics. We don't understand what we're doing when we derange the gut biome or increase rates of dementia. I mean, look at what fluoroquinolones do. We cause seizures, we cause dementia, we cause acute psychotic episodes. We have to understand, as you put it, uh, what we're doing with these uh, nuclear armaments. Oh, yeah. And it's, and 
not even, you know, I think we've got the sense, we probably pushed the sensitivity over in that goal of getting 100%. The, where I think where the value added is going to be in that specificity and talking mm -hmm. about the procalcitonin, you know, being able to get that, find these people that we have the index of suspicion on and then narrow it down to those that are actually likely to have a sepsis syndrome. Because really, you know, it sounds like the benefit and the, and the positive outcomes from most of these, you know, is the administration, early administration, but the main win is that early recognition. And so instead of letting this person with a fever and kind of a little altered mentation and some tachycardia and some tachypnea sit out in the lobby for four or five hours, the whole idea of the screen is we, is we trigger that to hopefully get that ball rolling and say, oh, this may be more serious than just somebody who's coming in with a little rhinovirus or something like that. We need to go ahead and commit to this and, and get that recognition and get these treatments done. So I agree more. The, um, where, do you, where do you think we go from here? Look into the crystal ball of sepsis future. Well, in our hospital, the immediate future is simply doing it. Mm -hmm. That's where we struggle. We know the right things to do to reduce mortality. We simply have to actually do some of it. But from a more global view from ASEP and from a research perspective, we need to look at the front end. The folks from critical care were not wrong. I don't think sepsis 3 is the answer, but they identified the correct research targets. Mm -hmm. uh, we do need to look for improved biomarkers. I don't think that QSOFA is the answer. I don't think that there's going to be such an easy um, solution as a quick physical marker. If it were that easy, emergency physicians would have already done it. We're really good at looking at people and identifying sick and not sick. And if we haven't already been able to do that, it's not going to be that easy. Well, that's, yeah, that, I mean, I think that easy, easy button, and we've, we've tried to do it with heart disease, you know, with ruling out that low risk or, or moderate risk acute coronary syndrome patients. And now even with this, trying to find one or two questions that gets you, that opens Pandora's box when really that clinical gestalt and that evaluation. And I, I think the biggest goals, the biggest things to focus on in your departments, if you're listening, is one, that screening and early recognition, getting them back. Um, we just had a CMS discussion here, and, and one of the things in some of the MTALA violations aren't just because you refuse to see somebody or you inappropriately transferred somebody. Sometimes it's they sat out there too long and you did not get them appropriately screened, get a medical screening exam in an adequate amount of time and there was a bad outcome. And so we have to think about that in terms of our processes and getting that lined up. I know that our EMS, there's a big push right now for code sepsis or at least an identification of a likely code sepsis in order to get the response that we see with code strokes and code stimmies and all the other stuff that we have. And I think that is something to consider because the faster we do it, the faster we recognize, the faster we get the antibiotics, access labs, appropriate fluids, I think the better our outcomes are clearly going to be because that seems to be where that evidence is and what the goal of, of this whole process has been, is that recognition and early management. Two things I would like to say as we close is, number one, don't sacrifice the good trying to be perfect. So in, in this day and time and in our department, and I know others all around the country, one of the big problems we have is crowding and we're backed up and we're overwhelmed. And so I understand that frustration, but you can't let these patients sit out in the waiting room and, and be upset at the fact that you can't get them back to a room. So number one, if you don't know what to do, but you think they're sick, get Rocephin in them. Mm -hmm. So I have gone out into the waiting room and I have injected a gram of Rocephin into somebody. So it doesn't with, have to be IV, I am. It doesn't, works. absolutely. It doesn't give say it to what your administration route has to be. It doesn't, and if I can only give you one antibiotic, I'm gonna give you Rocephin. Because you don't necessarily need vancomycin. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a high risk for pseudomonas and you don't have a high risk for MRSA, then probably Rocephin going to cover it. I can give you a tablet of azithromycin for, with the gram of Rocephin. I'm going to cover your pneumonia. I'm going to cover your UTIs. You probably don't have meningitis if you're talking to me. So I'm going to cover 90% of what you have. That's the only thing we put on our, on our life force helicopters. Rocephin is going to cover most of what we need. So um, remember, we can, we can do that. Um, it's going to cover most of your skin infections. The other thing is patients can hold their fluids and their, their IVs out in the lobby if they have to. It's not ideal. We'll get them back as fast as we can, but it can happen. And what that means sometimes is you can take a patient who has sepsis and prevent them from going into shock while they sit in the lobby. And then that patient is one you can put on the floor in the hospital instead of in the ICU. 
that's a much easier disposition and it's worth doing it's worth doing on the front end so don't let you know don't let the idea of perfection prevent you from doing what's good um, the other thing I'd like to say is on a more global scale is that advocacy is important it's important for us to engage CMS it's important to be involved in ASAP it's important to to let your voice be heard. So if you have interest in those things, there's a place for you. You don't have to be a rocket scientist. You just have to be a clinician who, who sees patients and who cares. Your voice matters, and, and uh, there's lots of uh, committees and in, in either at the state level or, or nationally. Um, we, we are interested in talking with you, so, so let us know. Dr. Jessica Whittle talking sepsis and some others. Um, how can folks get in touch with you if they have any questions? Sure. So my email is just whittle, W-H-I-T-T-L-E dot jessica, J-E-S-S-I-C-A at gmail.com. Or you can always look me up at uh, uh, on our website at UT Chattanooga. Um, I'll, I'll always be there. Thank you very much. Appreciate the time and the uh, information. Always a good conversation when we talk uh, sepsis, and it's always a seems to be a new conversation every single year now with, with all the updates. As for me, you can contact me, youreverydaymedicine at gmail.com, youreverydaymedicine at gmail.com, at Everyday Med on Twitter, and always on our ASAP Frontline Facebook page. Until next time, I'm Dr. Ryan Stanton, and this has been some ASAP Frontline.